So we've, we've heard the story, we've seen some pictures of it. Um, there's a, a, a teaching that goes along with the story that maybe is um, unfamiliar to you, and that is that this story teaches us about worship. And we've heard the story lots of different ways in our life, but um, perhaps it's new to you that, that this is also kind of what worship might look like. And part of us is sort of uh, taken aback by that because it's not, you know, in a building with pews and choir members. And, uh, there's no offering taken. They didn't even pass the pew pad, so we don't even know one of the guys' names. They've got Cleopas and Jesus and whoever. So, so <laughs> this is, um, you know, not the typical worship scene. But they didn't worship, and, and it is a model for us about what worship might look like. So, we're wondering a little bit about who they are, um, Cleopas and whoever. Even Cleopas, we don't know much about it. All we know, the only verse in Scripture about Cleopas was that he was one of the guys walking along, so there's not a whole lot to say about him either. What we'd see then is these aren't the all-stars of Jesus' crew. This is not some uh, who's who among Jesus' people. These are two guys who are walking along. They're not any particular place that would warrant God arriving. They're not doing anything that would make it um, self-evident that, that God would show up in their presence. And yet, here Jesus comes, seeks them out, and arrives among them. It, it's a reminder that, that God will show up in all kinds of unexpected places. I've been fortunate to be in some of the world's uh, biggest, I guess, uh, place religious spaces. I, I've been to... St. Peter's, I've been to the Duomo, I've been to the Hagia Sophia and the Blue Mosque, I've been to uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and Duke Chapel. I've been to some of the <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't, you know, I felt God's presence there, but, but not any more than, than sweating in Peru or Mississippi on mission trips. Or, or kneeling down in a, in a small little nondescript chapel with a friend praying for another friend, or singing here with you. I mean, it, you don't have to go to those places in order for God to be present. Sometimes God shows up in just regular old places. Jesus says that where two or three are gathered in His name, He is there among them, and, and He shows that in this Emmaus story. Two or three, two walking along, talking about. Uh, these things that have happened, and, and there he shows up, present with them. He's in, out here in the open, set loose on the world, appearing to regular old disciples, just plain, old, non, unimportant when you get to the big 12 disciples. He's like that. He just might appear anywhere. Or he might not. And that's a hard thing for us to sometimes get. So, sometimes he, he doesn't uh, come on demand. When two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be there, yes. But, but, but worship isn't like a vending machine. We can't just put in the right amount of change and manipulate Jesus to be here. He, he's present in, in real ways, but we can't always just demand an experience like the walk. It, it won't always be that kind of, of movement. The only one thing we need to know about worship is that it's about God. And therefore, not us. It, 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 all of worship is directed in God's direction, not, not ours. And so we don't get to control God the way we might want to. We don't get to force God to show up in ways that we want God to. You've been on walks. You've been on walks with other Christians. You've been on walks with other Christians talking about the things of God. And I'm guessing that not every single one of those walks you would describe as an Emmaus road experience. That there were important walks. Jesus was there in, in some real way. But, but not every walk is one where you profoundly felt the presence of God and, and were able to point to that as being when Jesus was revealed to you. And that's how it is with worship. Not every time we gather here in worship are we profoundly affected by the presence of God. It, it doesn't always work that way. We come to worship because God is worthy of our praise. That's why we show up. 
That's why we're here today. Now sometimes, hopefully often, God does move among us. God does bring about change within us, draw us nearer to Him, draw us near to His will. Sometimes God will reveal things about Himself that we may not have known before. And if that happens, all the better. All the more reason to give thanks that God has been here and moved us in His direction. One of the ways I think God does that is by our bringing ourselves to God, our, our fullest selves to God. What we notice in this story is that the, the, the disciples were looking sad. I imagine that they were walking kind of slowly, that sort of unpurposeful walk where you're just moving along, having a conversation, but you're so bewildered you don't know exactly where to go or why, you're just moving. And Jesus sees in them that they're, they're sad, and he starts to talk to them. And they don't hide it. They don't say, oh, we're fine. They, 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 they say, are you the only person who doesn't know what's going on? We thought we had the Messiah. We thought he was the one. And yet they, they took him and they crucified him. And he's gone, but, but maybe not. This morning an astonishing thing happened. These women came and told us that the tomb was empty. We don't know what to make of that. They didn't hide from, from Jesus who they were. They revealed to Him the deepest parts of their heart that day. They, they let it all out. And He met them where they were. I, I know a lot of times I will do my best to kind of pretend I've got it all under control. That, that, I can handle this, I'll be fine, no problem. And I can go along for a while like that. Um, but at some point, <laughs> when I finally surrender, then, then I, I meet the living Lord in a different way. Um, a lot of times that's when my prayers change. They get more real. During Holy Week, my, I found out my cousin was having a miscarriage. And... Um, I made a mistake calling her right before the Monday Thursday service. Uh, so I was talking to her husband, and he gave me the details, and as I was listening to it, I got more and more involved in it. And um, by the time I talked to her, I was undone. And, you know, then, then I was praying in a different way. You know, my prayers had shifted from, Lord, this is a sad thing, be with them, to kind of the grammar doesn't matter anymore. Um... I, it, this is just raw and real, and this is what's going on in my heart. Um, and, and then I'm, I was a little more open to God healing me than, than just trying to do it all myself. I think that happens in our worship when we sort of come with all we are and take off our masks and say, here we are. These are the things of my life today, Lord. Here it is. And I think that's when he begins to speak to us in different ways. That's what the disciples did on this road. They, they told him what's going on. I see this happen sometimes when we sing. When we, we'll be singing along, and sometimes we're singing well, and sometimes we're not. We're singing like this was the next thing that was on the road, the list to do, so we're doing it. And we'll, we'll be singing, and I'll look up, and I'll see some tears trolling down faces. And I'm like, are we singing the same song? <laughs> And, and I'm amazed, you know, but it's, it's not surprising when you think about it because you know, it, it's the words and the tune and the spirit all moving together and mixing this thing up. And, and God's here and, and people are feeling it and knowing it. God's getting to us. Not everybody at once. It's not like this one big cry fest. But, but God is, is coming to hearts and is working. And things are happening. And it's, it's real. Um, but it's not, it's this tension, right? So it, it, it's real that that happens. But if that's the only way we think we really worship, then we ask too much, or we demand it too much, or maybe too little. Um, but, but we made it again about us. If, if I have not cried, therefore I have not worshipped. Um, it, it, it's all about God making something happen for me, rather than me coming for God. That there's this, 
this real sense that we give thanks when God is doing things among us. But that's not the purpose for us coming. That we came here exclusively to praise God. So that's what the disciples do. They open themselves up to God. He moves in their midst. And then they respond. One of the things Jesus does is, is he takes the scriptures and reveals to them things about himself. And, and that's a part of every worship service, right? We bring out the scriptures, we read them, and then we speak up for them, of them. Um, it's, it's the essence of preaching what Jesus does, where he takes the ancient words of the faith and then brings them to the modern here. He, he tells those disciples he's walking with this, this what God has done in the midst of our people forever, and this is what the prophets were pointing to. He tells them this story that is so familiar, but the way he lays it out is the beginning of a new uh, understanding for them. That God has always sought out God's people to redeem them, to bring them back. God has always called for obedience, and we have always not gotten it right, and God has continued to seek us out and, and bring us back to redeem us. And the prophets looked for a day when, they were, when God would come in a different way, and and when God comes among us, it's a messy thing, but it's also a redemptive thing. And lives are changed forever. Eternity is changed forever. And he tells them the story. But they don't get it, right? Because they still just think he's some wise guy walking along. So they arrive at their destination, and he's headed on, and they say, come and, and eat with us. And that's when he breaks the bread, and they finally realize who he is. And sometimes I think that's what happens in proclamation, you know. I can't expect you all <laughs> in every scripture reading or every sermon or every offertory to be like, oh, now I understand. <clears throat> sometimes it won't be that day. Sometimes it won't be that week. Sometimes it won't be at all. It, but if I have to have it on my timetable, then I'm missing God's timing. So, so what happened with those disciples is Jesus took the scriptures and broke them open before them. They did not get it. Only when they looked back and said, weren't our hearts burning within us? Did they understand that he had been telling them the very word of God. In the moment they understood it was Jesus, when he took the bread, gave things, broke it and gave it to them. Communion, right? Holy communion. Sometimes we speak of God, but it's not until we touch God <coughs> that He touches us. Which is an elevated view of communion, a restored view, I would say, of communion. Communion is not just something we do when the calendar tells us we have to, or, or when twice a year we feel somehow worthy of it. Communion is something we receive because we're not worthy. But because this is a tangible way that God has given himself to us. God has said, here, feel me, feel my love. Know in your hands, in your mouth, in your heart, that I am among you. Communion takes it from, from words about God to God's very presence. The interesting thing that happens again in that story is... Is they are the host, right? The disciples take him to their place where they're hosting him. They welcome them, him into their, their home. They're the hosts, providing the best hospitality they know how. And yet immediately Jesus flips it. He's the one who picks up the bread and blesses them. We come to this place and it's God's house. And we've worked hard to paint it, fix it up and vacuum and set it. We've done our part to try to set it nicely. But we're always hosted by the Lord. It's this weird mix of He is the ruler of this place, and yet we're doing our best to show Him our best hospitality. To welcome Him, to pray, Lord, we want You among us. We're grateful that You're here. Move us. Which He does. In that story, He, he presides over 